too far gone now. They can't get in. Get water on it. All you've got. Fast. Pumps boost the pressure from the hydrants. The water is pushed out at 200 pounds per square inch. To bring a wild blaze under control, coordination is needed. Don't let it spread. Surround it. Move in. There's a 25 mile an hour wind fanning it, and a hundred men fighting with organized skill. It's for the chief to decide when they can enter the house with a salvage team. It's routine to check in closets and under the beds. People try to hide from fire. She went back upstairs to get properly dressed. The second one wanted to rescue her bird. The other, the cash she'd hidden away. They were told to get out, but they thought they had time. They couldn't see any flames. By then it was too late. In only three minutes it was too late. They like to be called firefighters. Firemen, they say, shovel coal. We fight fires. Like all professionals, they talk over their work. By the time that fire was discovered, fumes had spread all over. It was the fumes that caused the flashover. They get the bad ones at night, late when the fire has had a head start. By morning, the pretty flames are all out. Only an ugly ruin is left. Pensioners lived on that first floor in single rooms with everything they owned collected around them. Everything they owned stinking of smoke and wet ashes. Clothes stiff with ice like a winter wash, but not a clean wash. Poor people's valuables, old people's treasures. They left them behind and escaped with their lives. They come back to salvage whatever they can out of the avid fire and putrid smoke and tons of water and yellowish ice. Lucky, perhaps, to have that. An unfinished meal suggests how quickly it happens. Suddenly, it's everywhere all at once. For some, the future is made uncertain. For others, the past has been taken away. How did it happen? When investigators arrive, they ask that question. How did it happen? Where did it start? Witnesses claim the furnace exploded. They examine and probe pipes and blowers and test the doors. There is no evidence here of irregular fuel like naphtha or kerosene and the doors are intact. The explosion report is mistaken. It wasn't the furnace, but it began in the basement. They start with the likeliest causes. An old house converted to apartments puts an extra load on the wiring. 
toasters, heaters, hot plates, radios, irons, vacuum cleaners, TV. A 30-amp fuse where a 15-amp fuse belongs won't melt and break an overloaded line. These fuses had blown as they ought to. They follow a list of likely causes, checking them off, tracking it down. Under the kitchen floor, they finally find what they're looking for. Near the junction box, the heavy voltage line had broken. The electric arc was so hot, it set fire to the wooden flooring. Here it is, Phil. What do you think? That's it. This is the proof they need. Their evidence for the fire commissioner's court, where the cause of fire is determined and the responsibility charged. Three people are dead. Cause of death, fire. Cause of fire, defective materials. An electric short, smoke, gas, and suddenly, flame. They might have found proof of arson or criminal negligence or an accident, but this one's detected. Too late for those who have already died. People are anxious to get in out of the cold in winter. In most northern cities, the number of fires increases in winter and the number of deaths. Stay-at-homes turn up the heat and relax. Children play indoors and everyone feels snug and safe. This might have been a fire instead of a fire inspector they would have had to use the fire escape. Smoke and gas can fill the house in two minutes. The windows can melt in three, and in the rush of air, there's a flashover. You're supposed to be out by then. Any delay is suicide. Investigators determine the cause of fires. Inspectors try to prevent them from happening. Inspectors can't be everywhere at once, but according to law, everyone has a fire escape to permit him to get out in time. He's got three minutes at the most from the first alarm. The alarm is constantly ringing in stations. The station answers the ring for its particular zone. A firefighter is deaf to every call but the right one. Nevertheless, he's on duty. There's drill, for example. If someone can't get out of a burning building, he has to go in. You fight a fire from the top and work your way down. There's limited oxygen. Partial combustion produces gases that are lethal, as well as smoke and scorching heat. Why not, why not remove this here before you, you do that? Well, in case I drop it. No, well, all right, so probably you won't drop it now, but no. if you hold it with both hands yeah. and then lay it down, once you take off your mask, then you take that off first. Right. Right. The first scramble that night comes in in the middle of dinner. 6.20, chimney fire. Somebody else had their dinner spoiled. Passers-by turned in the alarm. 6.25, blaze extinguished. 8.12, grease fire in a restaurant kitchen. Owner turned in the alarm. Another meal spoiled. 934. Automatic alarm at a bank, and the door is locked. Eleven o'clock, mattress fire. One person had a last cigarette in bed. 
This is the bed. He woke up in time, but he might well have been overcome by smoke and everyone else was asleep. Well, now they're awake and the landlady protests she's told her tenants again and again. And the lieutenant says that he knows. You tell them again and again and again and they don't listen. Well, the fire is out. And that's the main thing. It's true. The fire is out and that's the main thing. But the lady's house is a mess. She's grateful to them for putting it out. But they had to use water to do it. Quite a bit. But no one can say in advance whether it will take a lot or a little. You pour it on, and you're the one who has to clean it up after. That's the routine of firefighting. They get ready now for the next one. It could come right away. It could burn slowly for hours unnoticed after everyone's gone to bed. Now they play pool or make themselves something to eat and they wait. For them, the opposite face of danger is tedium. The other face of bravery is boredom. The later the call, the worse they expect it to be. They can jump from indifference, even from sleep, into immediate action when the right bell rings. But it doesn't come. guard logs the hours. The calls that come in are for other zones, and the station grows quiet. have no keys, a key could get lost, and they get away fast. The alarm came in at 6.07. By 6.08, they're in boots and gear and out in the street, with no sirens at this time of night. The traffic is light, and the streets open up for them as they head towards the east. At dawn on the 5th of March, the temperature is four degrees above zero. Everyone's out. Neighbors and friends took in the survivors, and they've come back to watch the excitement. You fight a fire from the top. There's no room for ladder trucks in the lane, so the men have to work from the roof. It isn't out yet but he's climbing down. Something's gone wrong. Reporters wonder if this may be more than a routine story. Nobody knows. There's too much smoke up there to tell. But something's gone wrong. Spectators stop on their way to work or school and add to the confusion. A policeman said it sounded to him like the roof had collapsed and there were men working up there. Suddenly up on the roof the smoke is cleared and they're waiting to lower a body. Another reporter claims you can tell he's alive if his face is uncovered. But he doesn't look it from here. It 
it's not only smoke, it's the exposure to cold when he's soaked to the skin, and he has to be got to the hospital fast. The roof collapsed without warning, the chief says. We've brought two out alive, five men are still missing. Steel beams supported the snow-laden roof, but the steel was twisted by heat. With the weight of snow and water and ice, it suddenly caved, taking five men along with it. They had been dropped right through into the basement and buried under debris. Even with the fire still burning, there's hope that they may be still alive. But the rescue is slowed by the cave-in. They're in 10 feet of water down there. The thermometer is still at four above zero, and there's a wall of debris in their way. The crowd are subdued as they wait for the end. When the end comes, they learn they're too late. But there are still orders to carry out, a routine to follow, and a job to finish. Even spectators follow orders without complaint when it's learned that the men have died. At noon, the street becomes silent. The crowd which gathered for a circus of flames and excitement, maybe a woman being carried to safety, is shocked into stillness. We have been forced to think about death. We go our own way, not caring what happens to people around us. Then one day we're threatened ourselves. It could happen to me. This isn't my house. I suppose it could happen. Three minutes to get out. Where would I be? What time would it start? I wonder, in my house, just where it would start. They wonder, too, just where it will start. These are the men who have to wait for it to happen. Usually, the waiting is dull and the work routine. And usually, that's the worst part of the job. But not always. The opposite face of tedium is danger. And the opposite face of boredom is bravery. And it's a job that somebody's got to do. There will be fires today, as on all days. Alarm boxes will ring, and the stations will be manned as one shift relieves another. And the places of the dead men are filled by eager recruits who, ever since they were kids, had said, I'm going to be a fireman. The civic funeral leads through the main streets of the city. to safety. There are lives to be saved every day. 